Good morning, everyone. Morning. Zao an. Zao an, how? Uh, I think it's late in Boston, but it's early in Taipei, so I will start uh, right now. Um, it is our honor to have Professor Robert Weller for this year's Li Yi Yuan Lectureship uh, 2022. This is the fifth year of this lectureship. Let me give a brief introduction of Professor Robert Weller. Um, Professor Robert Weller is Professor of Anthropology at Boston University. His main area of research are religion and ritual, environment, political change and civil life, anthropological theory. He came to Taiwan in 1976 to 1979 to conduct his PhD dissertation fieldwork in Sanxia. We all know about his early books, such as Unity and Diversity in Chinese Religion, Resistance, Chaos, and Control in Taiwan, and Alternate Civility, Democracy, and Culture in China and Taiwan. But I personally like most the unruly God, divinity, and society in China, um, Professor Weller co-edited with Mir Shahar. His most recent books include Religion and Charity, The Social Life of Goodness in Chinese Society, How Things Count as the Same, Memory, Mimesis, and Metaphor in Social Life, and it happens among people, Renaissance and extension of the work of Frederick Barr. Professor Weller's research currently focuses on two broad projects. The first concerns China's extremely rapid urbanization. The second project is a collection of essays on silence. His previous work on silence has appeared as First, Savaging Silence, Exile, Death, and the Anthropology of the Unknown. Second, Respecting Silence, Longing, Rhythm, and Chinese Temple in an Age of Bulldozer. Third, most recently, uh, Censorship, foreclosure and the three deaths of Feng Zhen. And today's talk will be the fourth. And Professor Weller has talked to us that he will publish this collection of essays in the future on silence. So let's welcome Professor Weller's speech. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang. Let me start by saying how honored and pleased I am to have been invited today to give this lecture. Um, and let me apologize, especially to those of you who know me and know that my Chinese is okay um, for doing this in English. This topic is just much easier for me in English than in Chinese. And I trust that all of your English level is excellent. So I'm not worried about doing that. I was especially honored because um, not just that this is the Minzu So and that many of you are sitting in that seminar room that I have spent so many hours in myself. I wish so much I were there with you right now in person. Um, but also because this is the Li Yuan Memorial Lecture. And I wanted to begin by acknowledging my personal and intellectual debts to Professor Li. Uh, let me start a PowerPoint while I talk. Is that on screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. I first met Professor Lee when I was affiliated with the Institute of Ethnology while doing my dissertation fieldwork in the late 1970s. As a young graduate student, I found him somewhat intimidating, but in fact, he was unfailingly generous with me, sharing his insights into my work and sharing some of his own work with me as well, including some things that were only in manuscript form at the time. 
I was particularly inspired by one of those manuscripts, which for the first time really alerted me to the need to place Taiwan's religion in the context of contemporary changes, from increasing reliance on the market to urbanization to political transformation. His advice shaped my research directions at the time and for decades to come. My talk today, though, is shaped most directly by an interest in silence, something that Professor Lee did not address to my knowledge. I've been writing about two intertwined aspects of silence, its resistance to any easy interpretation on the one hand, and its crucial role in rhythm, and thus in sociality, on the other. Today, I'll explore just one aspect of those problems by thinking through the relationship between silence and noise in ritual. We often think of silence and noise as opposites, but they share one very important feature. Both are non-discursive and opaque to any confident attempt at interpretation. That is, both are open to a wide range of interpretations or to no interpretation at all. If we were to think of ritual mostly as a system of meanings, as in the once dominant anthropological traditions of Clifford Geertz or Victor Turner, the frequent role of these insistently non-discursive elements might seem puzzling. Nevertheless, they are everywhere. Everywhere, but not equally everywhere. As I will discuss, we can see silences in rituals most clearly as they create rhythms. The way that the silence between hand claps is as crucial to the rhythm as the sound of the clap itself. Noise is less well suited to that role because noise can merge too easily into the sounds that follow and precede it. Beyond that rhythmic role, though, noise is extremely common in all kinds of ritualized situations, while silence is rare. Why? And why, as Rodney Needham pointed out long ago, is noise particularly associated with transitions, while silence is not? The answers, I'll argue, have to do especially with the relationship of ritual to framing, and with the potential of silence to unframe if it is not carefully circumscribed. As a first step toward thinking about silence and noise in ritual, let me begin with a simple example of a Western classical music concert. The first such concert I remember attending was when I was maybe seven or eight years old. I was with my brother, who was a year younger, uh, and our sister Judy, who would have been in her mid-teens at the time, had been put in charge of us. Judy was already quite experienced in the ways of little brothers, so she sat between us to make sure we didn't misbehave. I no longer remember where my parents were or why Judy was stuck with us or even any of the music at the concert. The one memory that has stuck with me concerns the end of the first movement of whatever they were performing. As it came to a rousing conclusion, some people in the audience began to clap and so did my brother and I, only to find our hands caught in Judy's iron grip. Baffled, we both looked at her, but she only shook her head, keeping the silence intact. From then on, we carefully followed her lead on applause, even though we were still puzzled. Afterward, she explained that we should only clap at the end of the whole piece and never between movements. When we asked her why, she said, those are just the rules. Then why did some of the other people clap? Those people, Judy told us, did not really understand the rules, but we do, so we have to follow them. In a sense, of course, this was more of a reiteration of the rule than an explanation. An actual explanation, for instance, might have looked at the rowdy noise that accompanied most concerts in the early 19th century, and at the extensive campaigns to enforce stillness um, on the audience throughout the end of that century and into the next. Yet in another sense, Judy's answer went straight to the most important point. With Western classical music, we applaud when the musicians or the conductor come on stage and at the end of pieces. We never applaud between movements. We do so because it shows that we accept a convention, which is effectively arbitrary. The arbitrariness is obvious in this case, because different genres of Western music have evolved different conventions. Thus, at an opera, applause is permitted after arias. At a jazz performance, the audience is supposed to applaud after each solo. 
This little story, this helps us think about the formal structure of rituals and about the role of noise and silence in them. There's little symbolism to interpret in a case like this, which focuses our attention instead on the purely formal properties of ritual. Those formal properties are also the key to making the role of the non-discursive, noise and silence, less puzzling. Rituals are, first of all, repetitive. The internal structure of any given ritual very often has repeated elements, like the brief silences between movements in this case. And all rituals reiterate past performances of the same ritual, like classical music concerts. After all, if something occurs only once, we would never call it a ritual. Repetition means that rituals are also highly conventionalized, since repeating requires acceptance of a set of standards about what would let this ritual count as the same as a previous one. As Rappaport phrased it, ritual is, quote, the performance of more or less invariant sequences of formal acts and utterances not entirely encoded by the performers. These formal properties of ritual explain Judy's rather unsatisfying answer about clapping between movements. The ritual is possible only because we accept its rules. We adapt to its conventions, and in so doing, we reinforce them. Judy knew that applause conventions at concerts must have come from some unknown historical process, but she was quite right to point instead at the importance of just accepting convention. Much the same happened in my earliest fieldwork in Taiwan, when I would ask people for explanations of their rich ritual symbolism. Consider, for example, the pig in this slide. Why dangle a fish from its pineapple-filled mouth? Why stab a knife into the back of the neck? And why leave a sort of mane of hair there? Why the necklace of old coins? I asked such questions of many participants, all of whom answered simply that they did it either because we are Chinese, they would say, or because it looks better like that, a suyani. These explanations dashed my hopes for an elaborate exegesis along the lines that Victor Turner had led me to expect from his analysis of Ndembu symbolism. People seemed to agree that such an explanation should exist and suggested that maybe I could try asking a Taoist priest. They themselves, however, neither needed nor wanted such an explanation. Their answers, like Judy's, point entirely to the acceptance of convention as a necessary and sufficient explanation. One consequence of this conventional nature of ritual is that we place a frame around the ritual moments. Without framing, how would we know when we start and end? How can we know whether it counts as a repetition if we do not mark off the beginning and the end of the repeated unit? Rituals are often framed in multiple ways, in space, as we delimit a special arena for the event, in time, as we mark off particular moments, like the Sabbath or New Year's Eve or my birthday, and in sound as well. This formal understanding of ritual is by no means limited to the religious sphere, as the classical music concert showed. A play similarly has a designated space and time and always marks the beginning and ending with the noise of applause. Courtrooms also have a designated space, a highly conventionalized notion of jurisdiction, and mark openings and closings with the bang of a gavel. None of these events are as fully ritualized as something like Muslim daily prayers or Catholic mass, but they share with religious ritual the need to mark off a temporary world that exists as if it were true, true within its frame. In what follows, I'll think through how silence, that is, uninterpretable quiet, and noise, uninterpretable sound, play out in rituals. Both are similarly non-discursive, but as we shall see, they usually do not occupy the same niche. Noise is far more common in ritual contexts, and silence is rare. My intention is to understand why, with a focus on the relative fragility of silence and on its potentially different relationship to framing. So let me turn away from these abstract considerations for a moment and introduce some of the ethnographic material I've been thinking about. Much of what follows dates from my earliest fieldwork in Taiwan, the late 1970s. 
I'll discuss several rituals to show the interplay of sound and silence, but we'll spend most of the time on half a dozen funerals for neighbors that took place in 1978 when I was living on the outskirts of the northern Taiwan town of Sanxia. Much has changed in the decades since then, of course, including quite fundamental transformations in Taiwan's economy and politics and important changes as well in the specific rituals I'll discuss. Nevertheless, the late 1970s works as well as any period for the theoretical issues I want to discuss, and many of the general patterns of sound and silence apply as well now as they did then. The overwhelming experience of most rituals in Taiwan is noise, not silence. The most elaborate rituals there now are the annual pilgrimages in honor of the birthday of the goddess Mazu, and on a smaller scale, for uh, those for the birthdays or rites of cosmic renewal for any major community temple. These can attract crowds numbering in the thousands or many tens of thousands for the larger ones. All these rituals take place in many media at the same time. There are the smells of incense, burning paper money, food offerings, and the many vendors who come to sell street food. The visuals of costumed ritualists, elaborate altars, and the crowds themselves and a huge volume of sound that includes firecrackers, opera troops, the raucous music accompanying the ritualists along with their intoned texts, and the crowd noise itself, which carries no expectation of the quiet of a concert hall or a mainline Christian church. All of this happens simultaneously. At one such ritual I attended, three operas were being performed at the same time, all highly amplified and near each other, the resulting sonic density, the cacophony of the senses, is part of the aesthetic that Taiwanese call renal, where colors are bright, crowds are huge, and activity is ceaseless. Adam Chow, working in northwestern China, where the same aesthetic is called honghuo, fiery red, glosses the feeling as red-hot sociality. The people themselves will say that a hot and noisy ritual is a direct index of the efficacy and presence of the god herself. The loudest ritual experience I remember was the first time I was invited to parade through Sanxia's streets, along with dozens of other people, to accompany Zhu Shigong, the most important local deity, as he traveled through his territory. I felt flattered, even though, in fact, anyone could have joined the marchers. I did not, however, realize that the packed crowd of onlookers would be tossing strings of lit firecrackers at our feet for the entire time. And uh, in the interest of honesty, that's not actually me in the slide. <laughs> it's someone else having firecrackers tossed at him. The smoke from the firecrackers soon grew astringently pungent, and the explosions were both deafening and terrifying. The god protected us, of course, so no harm was done beyond some temporary ringing of the ears. This was a very typical use of firecrackers to mark periods of transition. In this case, the literal transit of Zhu Shigong from one place to another. The Chinese New Year, the transition from one zodiac sign to the next, marking a change in the humoral content of time, is equally punctuated by barrages of firecrackers and fireworks. People will even mark the opening of a new shop, which is another sort of transition, with strings of firecrackers. The non-discursive but sonic space-filling nature of noise is perfect for marking these moments of transition. This relation between firecrackers and transitions brings us to a famous old puzzle in anthropology, which concerns percussive noise in particular. After citing a great deal of cross-cultural evidence, Rodney Needham concluded in a 1967 article with what he called, I quote, an unduly forthright and apparently unlikely hypothesis. There is a connection between percussion and transition. That's the end of the quote. He threw up his hands, however, when trying to think about why such a connection might exist. And he described the problem as a quote, again, seemingly intractable. As we have seen, his findings are perfectly consistent with what happens in Taiwanese ritual, as well as Chinese rituals everywhere although we might want to broaden his category of percussion to something more like noise in order to include other extremely dense sonic effects like multiple competing music performances, 
as well as the percussive noise of firecrackers, drums, and cymbals. Needham's observation brings us directly back to the problem of how to frame our entries and exits from as-if worlds, like rituals, concerts, sports events, or court sessions. Noise tends to take over exactly during those transitions between ritual, or concert or play, ritual time, and ordinary time, and at those times within a ritual that involve important transitions of space and time, like the transit of a deity from one place to another. Within each as-if world, there is plenty of space for symbolism, including that of discourse. While most Taiwanese and Chinese ritual is loud most of the time, the discursive parts, when the ritualist reads a petition out loud, for instance, or when people are instructed to bow and offer incense, those parts are relatively quiet and not completely drowned out by the noise. Noise takes over during the moments of transition, I would suggest, because representational content, whether verbal or in other symbols, is impossible during the moments when we are in between worlds. Representational content requires a world for us to make any sense of it at all. No word, for instance, makes sense apart from the world of some language. There are no words when we are not in any ontological space. We cannot communicate, not even with spirits, at those moments of passage from one world to the next. Noise is thus a perfect marker for such transitions. It commands our attention as it fills the sonic and often mental space. No one can talk over three operas playing at once, and no one can think as strings of firecrackers explode at their feet. Noise, with its formal, non-representational, and anti-discursive properties, is one of the only things that can exist if there is no world. That is why, in many mythological traditions, what precedes the creation of the world is not silence, and certainly not language, but chaos, noise. That is, symbols, discourse, and representation can only function within a world of established conventions that allows us to understand them. Outside of any such world, there can only be noise. For the same reason, noise is what keeps rituals open to what lies beyond their worlds and beyond the worlds of everyday life as well. It points to the possibility of that which has not, or not yet, been signified. So why not silence in this role? Silence shares the characteristics that make noise so appropriate for marking transitions. In particular, just like noise, silence is non-representational and non-discursive. Why is it so rare in the Chinese and Taiwanese rituals I studied, and apparently rare in rituals in much of the world? One reason is that ritual conventions generally require strict rules about time, space, and behavior. By filling the sonic and sometimes cognitive space, noise allows little opportunity to depart from those rules. Silence, on the other hand, is fragile. It breaks all too easily. A child cries at the wrong moment. Someone's phone rings. People walk by too engrossed by their own conversation to notice the ritual. The silence also leaves our minds to wander freely away from the moment at hand. In addition, there's always the possibility that someone can disrupt the silence intentionally as a way of rejecting the ritual moment. Noise, in contrast, can simply absorb all those interruptions. The fragility of silence means that ritual liturgies usually make far less use of it than noise. Still, we can identify several forms of ritual silence that I'll briefly discuss here, including silences of rhythm, moments of silence, and silences of discipline. One example of rhythmic silence can be found in the annual rituals performed at the Temple to Confucius in Taipei, held every year on his birthday. This event attempts to recreate court rituals of earlier dynasties, including the use of sets of archaic bells and chimes that go very far back in Chinese history and that are never used in more everyday rituals. The liturgy relies on a master of ceremonies who directs every step of the ceremony. For example, he will very slowly intone, light the first stick of incense. And one of the costume participants will slowly move to the incense pot and do so. And then, still at a snail's pace, light the second stick of incense. 
and so on, through three rounds of incense and the intervening silences, three offerings of wine and intervening silences, and many other steps, each done at a pace that might generously be described as stately and less generously as ponderous. Here, the long silent moments alternate with speech and action, creating a very slow pulse and achieving a very thin sonic density that is the opposite of red hot sociality. The silences here measure the slow time of the ritual, but they do not mark any particular transitions. Their non-representational nature still leaves plenty of space for wandering minds, but the verbal instructions and required ritual actions keep each moment of silence very short, just a matter of seconds, so that its fragility does not much come into play. Such slow rhythms, of course, occur in many parts of the world, like the patient pace of an Easter vigil service, for example. This general ritual structure occurs elsewhere in Chinese societies today, especially when organizers are eager to avoid the excitement and potential chaos of a hot and noisy ritual. Thus, the main temple in Sansha did this on the Lunar New Year's Eve while I was there in 1979. This had been a recent innovation introduced to allow respectful worship of the deity without the bedlam of thousands of people pushing against each other trying to get the good luck of being the first to burn sticks of incense in the God's incense burner at the stroke of the new year. The temple management had felt threatened, sometimes even physically, by the chaotic crowds in the past. They thus changed to this new format, which protected the fragility of even the limited rhythmic silence in this style of ritual by locking the temple doors and performing their offering with only a very select group of temple leaders. Only when they finished did they open the doors to the chaos waiting outside. I saw another version of it in Nanjing in 2014, when local leaders put on a ritual for the birthday of Mazu at one of her temples there, but seemed to have little idea how to proceed. They began with formal speeches in the style of a communist political meeting, and then moved to a court-style, slow-paced set of offerings with a very low sonic density. In this case, however, the impatient crowd simply overrode the silence with its constant conversation, and the orderly offerings soon devolved into people offering incense at will. This photo is of that ritual in Nanjing right before it fell apart. Thus, the silence can fail, even in this very constrained form. A second use of silence, ritual use of silence, is limited to just a moment. Moments of silence control the fragility by keeping the time short, almost always just a minute or two. Nevertheless, even a minute can be almost impossible to maintain. As an example, I was riding in Boston's public transit system on September 11th, 2002, the first anniversary of the attacks on the World Trade Center. The media had widely publicized a request for a minute of silence at the moment of the first attack. The train I was on halted at that moment to honor the request, and the usual babble of conversation and phone calls stopped, except for a couple of oblivious foreign tourists who kept talking to each other, apparently unaware of the sudden silence around them. The limitation of such moments of remembrance to just a single minute is exactly because the silence is increasingly hard to control as time passes. In fact, large public silences like this are a modern invention, probably beginning in 1912 and becoming widespread only after the First World War. They require modern means of communication and coordinated time, as well as relying on the tractability of large populations. Over the course of the, cent of the century since then, they have mostly decreased the time involved to just one minute, and in some cases have replaced silence with the noise of applause, precisely because the percussive noise of applause is more robust and resistant to interpretation. Finally, let me mention the silences of discipline. The most famous of these stem from virtuosic self-discipline, like Trappist monks, Thomas Merton, just to mention the most famous one, who maintain silences through most of their days, or the silence of some Buddhist or Taoist clergy, who may not speak for years on end. These cases move us outside ritual, however, 
since the silence extends to every moment of life. Or, in most of these cases, perhaps it's better to say that the point of the silence is to dissolve the boundary between ritual and ordinary life. Silence is thus certainly not marking a transition across a frame, but dissolving the frame itself. And I'll return to such silent unframing later on. Silence can also be enforced, like a child in a timeout. In ritual contexts, this can happen mostly through peer pressure, usually not to focus people on the silence, but to force them to pay attention to the ritual's other sounds and actions. Silence in a concert hall works that way, as does the congregation's general silence in many forms of Christianity. Sometimes it happens instead with enforcement, for instance, when people being initiated have to keep silent at the risk of corporal punishment. Even the socially enforced silences of this kind usually have the backing of higher authority, as when ushers escort rowdy members of the audience out of a theater or concert hall, or a conductor stops the performance and glares at the audience because someone's phone has rung. In almost all of these cases, however, the ritual as a whole is not silent. Its talk and activity continue, even as some of the participants are required to maintain silence. So let me turn to unframing silence. Fragility is not the only reason for the relative rarity of silence in ritual. If noise is an ideal framing device, as I've suggested by expanding from Needham's work, silence often works as an unframing device. For that reason, it can undermine any kind of ritual performance of an as-if world by threatening its frames. We can see this role of silence most easily if we begin from non-religious sources. The most famous silence in music is probably John Cage's piece called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, after the length of time that the first performance took. The, you're looking at the score on the screen. At that concert, the performer sat down at the piano, opened the keyboard cover, and just sat there. After the allotted time, he closed the keyboard cover again. Cage's point was to force us to listen in a different way that extended outside the conventions of the classical music concert. We would learn from him that we should listen mindfully and in the moment to hear an entire soundscape that is always present, the hum of a heating system, the birds outside, the blood flowing through our own ears. While opening and closing the keyboard cover still provided a kind of reduced frame around the performance, the general point was instead to unframe music, even the category music, as much as possible. Thus, if we take Cage seriously, it is no longer clear what categories like music or a concert mean. Even the concept of silence itself comes undone, as we realize that there is no such thing in our unmediated experience. These words and concepts themselves have been unframed by forcing us outside of their usual conventions. I mentioned a couple of uh, uh, novels with blank chapters, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about it today. The best known exception to the rule that silences are rare or very tightly controlled in rituals appears to be Quaker meetings. Based on what I have just said, however, I hope to show that Quaker silence makes sense within the broader logic of silence and noise in ritual, even though it is unusual. This is clearest through a comparison of Protestant noise and silence, through the contrast between Quaker silence and Pentecostal sound, especially its incomprehensible sound of speaking in tongues. Silence dominates Quaker meetings, and you see one on the screen. These meetings have no liturgy and no set agenda beyond occasional announcements. Members of the meeting sit silently, often for long periods, and speak only when inspired by the light, sometimes a word they sometimes use for Jesus and sometimes as a more general quality of the divine. Quakers even see silence as the key to establishing a sense of the meeting when they make group decisions at business meetings. Meetings could be even more radically silent during the Quakers' early period in the mid-17th century, when a complete and perfect meeting for worship could be held in complete silence without a word being spoken out loud, God's word 
manifested in the inward experience of his presence and the communion of the congregation was sufficient. That was a quote from Richard Bauman. For the Quakers, this was part of a radical Protestant questioning of human language and more broadly of all human constructions that stood between us and God. Early Quakers thus refused to take off their hats in front of superiors. They insisted on using thee and thou for second person singular because the thou you distinction in the singular also marked purely human distinctions of status. Liturgically, they marked no holidays, no special holidays. As Richard Bauman put it, quoting again, anything that smacks of human will or customary formalism in worship was to be rigorously excluded. This imperative represented a rather sweeping departure from prevailing religious practice because it precluded any kind of established formalized liturgy prescribing who would speak when and the form of the words spoken. It's the end of the quote. So God's language was absolute and true. Quakers, after all, also accept the opening words of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Human words, however, were another matter altogether. While not inherently evil, human languages were the result of the collapse of the Tower of Babel and could never be adequate to contemplate divine wisdom. The silence at Quaker meetings allows space for the light to enter and for people to come closer to the divine message. This is the Quaker answer to the problem that people constantly bend the words of ordinary language to suit their earthly purposes and to mouth empty conventions. As Roy Rappaport pointed out, the very features that make denotative human language powerful imply two very serious problems. First, the arbitrary nature of the connection between a symbol and its meaning carries with it the ability to lie. As he said, the very freedom of sign from signified that enlarges by magnitudes the scope of human life also increases by magnitudes possibilities for falsehood. Second, there's what he calls the problem of alternatives. Quoting again, if there is enough grammar to think and say Yahweh is God and Marmuk is not, or socialism is preferable to capitalism, there is, obviously, enough to imagine, say, and act upon the opposite. Religions may never have put it in quite these terms, but these are the considerations that often led to a suspicion of human language. The Christian God's language, however, is true. It is never a lie and never open to alternatives. For Quakers, that is why silence offers a superior way of being with him. The other major Protestant response to these problems, however, is anything but silent. Pentecostal speaking in tongues accomplishes something very similar to Quaker silence in the sense of avoiding, um, avoiding the weaknesses of ordinary human speech. As Tomlinson writes about Christian glossolalia, that speaking in tongues in Fiji, semantically, the words are supposed to be unintelligible when uttered, indexing the otherworldly, even miraculous fact of their utterance. But pragmatically, their utterance indexes the Holy Ghost's presence in a person speaking these divine words, and that presence is held to be the meaning that really matters. My main experience of this was with a congregation of the True Jesus Church, Zhen Yesu Jiaohui, in Nanjing in 2014. The True Jesus Church is an indigenous Chinese Christianity that began in 1917 during the early global expansion of the Pentecostal movement. Unlike the Quakers, True Jesus and other Pentecostal worship does have the usual liturgical organization we would expect from a Protestant service, including things like sermons and the singing of hymns. It differs most strikingly, however, at the moments when the congregation is called on to pray. At those times, everyone in the group drops to their knees and begins to speak in tongues. This is considered one of the gifts that Pentecostals receive from the Holy Spirit. Their version of glossolalia tends not to have anything like phonemes or syllables, but most people just loudly and quickly repeat a single sound over and over or shrilly trill their tongues for the entire time. 
Each person appears to be in their own world, and many have their eyes closed. The result of several hundred such voices is a sonic density so thick that it becomes complete cacophony for the many minutes of each prayer period, ending abruptly at a signal from the leader. <clears throat> Both noise and silence seem like equally good solutions to the problem of false language, since both are non-discursive. Daniel Maltz, who made a much earlier comparison of Quaker silence and Pentecostal noise, suggested that the inherent logical contrast between noisiness and silence allows reformers to stress silence as a protest against noisiness or advocate noise as a protest against silence. In his analysis, the different historical contexts of Quakerism in the 17th century and Pentecostalism in the 20th thus explain when the various kinds of protests will become important. This account, however, does not explain why Quaker silence is so much more rare a solution than Pentecostal noise. In the current world, Pentecostals outnumber Quakers a thousandfold and more. There are roughly five times more members of just the relatively small True Jesus Church than there are Quakers, who number just over 300,000. Even in the 17th century, Quakers were greatly outnumbered by Puritans and other radical Protestants who did not emphasize silence, not to mention Catholics and members of the Church of England. That is, Protestant noise is a vastly more common substitute for language than silence. Quaker meetings thus offer a theoretical puzzle, both in relation to the far greater prevalence of Pentecostal noise and to the larger pattern I've been discussing, where noise occurs much more frequently than silence in ritual contexts. We can understand this puzzle through the two factors I've been discussing here, the general fragility of silence that makes moments of silence so brief in most contexts, and the ability of silence to unframe. Quaker meetings are not totally silent, of course, so that breaking the silence is not inherently problematic. The problem is breaking the silence inappropriately by making comments that might be too loud, too long, too frequent, or filled with content considered inappropriate. Quaker meetings avoid this in part by making clear how important a role silence will play, so that anyone who requires making or absorbing more noise will look elsewhere. In part, they also quietly discipline speech they consider inappropriate, most often with a few words from leaders in private after the meeting, or more rarely during the meeting itself. The unframing work of silence is probably most crucial of all for the Quakers. In fact, Quaker silence is not really an exception to the pattern that silences are rare in ritual, because Quakers do not intend their meetings to be rituals at all. Quakers rejected all ritual forms, even more radically than other Protestants, who themselves had rejected the ritual formalism of the Catholic Church. While other sorts of Protestants would recognize the general liturgical structure of a true Jesus service, for instance, a Quaker meeting has no liturgies at all. Such meetings, in a sense, are a continuation of how life should always be, so that participants do not frame the beginning of the meeting at all. The meeting begins when the first person walks into the room and sits down. Silence here is an attitude toward life rather than a ritual step and brings us back far closer to the unframing that John Cage was trying to foster in his four minutes and 33 seconds. So now let me turn to a more extended ethnographic example of ritual sounds, village rituals on burial days that I observed in Sansha mostly in 1978, with a particular focus on the funeral of a 90-year-old woman in March of that year. These rituals include many of the dynamics of ritual noise and silence I've been discussing, and they include one of the very few moments in my experience where silence comes to dominate a ritual. They thus offer few fruitful ground to think about the similarities and differences that stem from the non-discursive nature of both silence and noise. We already have some detailed ethnographic descriptions of Taiwanese village funerals from around the same period, including Stuart Thompson's analysis of food offerings and Emily Ahern's description of the entire process, though neither one attends much to the soundscape. In addition, I imagine that most of you listening today are deeply familiar with such rituals, 
So for that reason, I will not recapitulate the entire ritual complex, but just give a brief summary. And in fact, just give a brief summary based only on the few photographs um, that I had that were presentable enough to show to you. So th this is the first. This is a moment where the descendants are making offerings in front of the tablet of the deceased person. They're ordered by generation and by gender, and they're instructed by, in the photograph, you can see the two men, one on either side of the table, basically telling everybody what to do. As in all moments uh, um, like this, where people are being told what to do, it's a relatively quiet, not silent, but a relatively quiet moment. Here, before the coffin is taken out to, for its actual burial, the descendants are being uh, led around the coffin three times by the Saigong, who's running the ritual, the man with the symbols here. The moment of transition, or the period of transition, when the coffin is actually taken out of the village um, to the burial ground, is loud, really loud. So this is just a photograph of a part of a long procession. Um, the ancestral tablet in one of these sedan chairs, other paraphernalia and others, a Western band, which you see in this photograph, um, a Taiwanese band also playing, and the ritualists themselves playing at the same time. So it's extremely loud uh, and, and somewhat chaotic as, as the group marches through the village. This is at the burial site itself, the first time offering incense at the grave. This is the 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 dili, the, the feng shui guy holding his compass, saying good luck kinds of words as the descendants um, are making offerings. You can see the blue, already an adult, is a great grandchild. So this, this woman had lived to a very old age. Uh, this is again a, a quiet, not a not silent, but quite quiet moment. Led around the grave now three times to mark that, and then back to the village. And then most of what happened after that was at night, and I, um, my my photographic technique was not up to nighttime photography. So that's that's the end of the photographs of the funeral. So much of the anthropological analysis of these rites has focused on the rich symbolism involved. I would add to that work only the idea that the day also makes for an accomplished piece of emotional choreography. Up until this day, the corpse in its coffin had lain in the front room of people's houses, constantly attended to. This was the first day when mourning moves instead to the public. It began with grief as the women loudly wailed and cried. All the descendants may feel sad in their own ways, of course, but at this moment they are ritually compelled to express their grief loudly and publicly, no matter how they feel at the moment. And as with much of the Confucian idea of ritual, the point is that performing grief will make you feel the grief rather than the other way around. That is why hired mourners were perfectly acceptable, even desirable at this point. Right after the grief, the process of reintegration began as the kinship hierarchy of descendants was reinforced and created through the offerings of incense, as in that first photo I showed you. At this point, outpourings of emotion like grief were no longer welcome, and everyone was instead expected to perform their respect for the dead and their place in the hierarchy. This was followed by the obvious symbolism of circling the coffin before leaving the village and circling the grave before returning. There was still a hierarchy of seniority in how people lined up, but the experience was far less rigidly determined than the earlier offering of incense, in addition to marking so clearly the removal of the dead person from the village. It fit well with the feng shui master's invocation of good fortune for the future of the entire group. The emotional trajectory was thus from grief to order to a shared future for the descendants. The loudest noise and the least discourse as usual, had been reserved for the moments of transition between village and grave. The emotion work continued on the evening of that day. The, rituals had the ritualists had continued reading texts and playing music through the afternoon, usually attended only by a single representative of the mourners. Everyone else came back in the early evening, 
where now the mood shifted to something carnivalesque, entertaining, sometimes funny. The ritualists, who had been loudly working their way through their texts all day, now switched to activities that were supposed to help smooth and speed the dead person's passage through the perils of the underworld. At the beginning, one of the ritualists invoked various deities, including those of the underworld. He accompanied this with many mudras, hand signs, contorting his fingers into implausible shapes and attracting onlookers with that alone. He also preached to the crowd, admonishing people to be good so they could avoid the tortures of the underworld, which were described in some detail. In the process, he also improvised in ways that could sometimes be comedic. One, for instance, on seeing me, suddenly broke into Atala, Atala, ABC, ABC, one, two, three, one, two, three. This got a general laugh, though not from me. After this, the village head, or another respected fig figure, read a long petition, which the ritualist described to me as the only really important moment of the evening. After invoking the gods again, it gave details about the ancestry and residence of the deceased, and then individually named each of the mourners. It ended with a prayer that sins be forgiven. After that, the ritualist acted out various parts of the soul's passage through the underworld in ways that revealed a completely new repertoire of their skills, tumbling, juggling, fire eating, and other general clowning around. When I asked people whether they thought these performances really helped the dead person through the underworld, most people were skeptics, but they watched with great pleasure anyway. If the emotional trajectory of the first part of the day was grief in order to create a shared future, now it was comic relief after the strains of a draining day. Finally, very late at night, the descendants gathered in a circle around an enormous pile of paper spirit money. Instructed by one of the ritualists, each held on to the mourning dress of the person next to them as the money was set afire and they all stood silently watching the pile flare up and then gradually burn down to nothing but ashes. These final minutes of the burial day, even when the street noise had largely died away, were the only ritual moment I experienced in Taiwan where communal silence reigned. How can we understand this rare moment of ritual silence? I've been suggesting that there are two primary reasons for the rarity of such silences in rituals. The first reason is that, as we have seen, silence is too easy to break and to disrupt, while noise can simply ingest competing sounds. That is why silent moments in rituals appear mostly to accomplish the work of rhythm. In the Chinese or Taiwanese cases, this is most obvious in the Confucian rituals and their echoes in modern state-sponsored ritual, like that Nanjing temple I mentioned above. Or in the most hierarchical moments of the funeral, where a master of ceremonies instructs people to burn incense in rank order by generation and gender. All rituals create a rhythm in the sense that they have a liturgical framework whose steps create a kind of time. Sometimes these rhythms consist of longer units, as in the broad structure of the burial day, with its noisy times, wailing over the coffin, parading out to the cemetery, escorting the soul at night, and its quieter moments, waiting at the graveyard, or reading the petition, or the fire at the end of the day. In all these cases of rhythm, the silence need not be absolute. It's sufficient just to lower the sonic density enough to establish a slow rhythm. Beyond that, silences are limited either to brief times, the moment of silence, or to strongly disciplined situations. The second reason for the rarity is that silences dissolve frames by opening up new worlds of possibility. They do this because silence's opacity offers a wide space for interpretation. We never know for sure what a silence is supposed to indicate. Noise, on the other hand, fills sonic and often cognitive space. Both silence and noise are non-discursive, but only silence opens up to a world of infinite possibility. The idea of the ritual frame is crucial in understanding the roles of noise and silence. All rituals contain both external and internal frames. The external frames distinguish ritual times and space from other contexts, while the internal frames mark transitions within the ritual itself, like the crucial conversion marked by the loud parade, uh, marked by the loud parade out to the burial site 
from a disturbing corpse in the house to an honored ancestor. At the risk of being overly formalistic, the frame is what distinguishes art from wallpaper. That is, it marks something as adhering to the conventions of art in just the same way as we have to mark the conventions of ritual. The frame does not depict the substance of the work, but it makes the work possible. It separates one kind of space from another. Unlike paintings, rituals take place in time and so require a different sort of separation. Noise and the frame combine to help solve Needham's half-century-old puzzle about percussion and transition. Noise is perfect for marking the transition from one frame to another because only the non-discursive exists outside frames so that noise can mark the moment between frames without leading us to wander away completely. Silence's opacity to easy interpretation, the way it sends each of us into our own thoughts, its capacity to unframe, and its fragile openness to interruption, however, make it, a much, make it much less useful as a marker of transitions. It's not impossible that we could frame with silence instead of noise, but only in circumstances that are highly controlled. With this in mind, we can reconsider that rare silence at the end of the funeral ritual. It is appropriate there in part because the most important transitions have already happened with plenty of noise the removal of the corpse from its home village and its initial treatment as an ancestor, and, with the evening performances, its transition through the underworld toward rebirth. One could even argue that this silence does not mark the end of the funeral ritual, although it does mark the end of the burial day. Further rituals will be conducted every week for seven weeks, and after that, the regular worship will continue at the ancestral altar at home and occasionally at the graveside. Thus, in a sense, this silence does not mark an end, but is just part of, an, of a changing rhythm now that the dead person has been incorporated as an ancestor. In part, I also see it as an important conclusion to the emotional choreography of that day, from the grief of the early part to the solemnity of the incense offerings, to the humor and excitement of the evening, and finally to this moment of calm, united in a circle of descendants, watching the flames slowly die down. The relatively small size of the group, the late hour, and the exhaustion of the long day make the silence easier to maintain than it would otherwise be, and the ritual frame around the entire burial day can thus be allowed to fade out slowly instead of undergoing a rapid change through noise. Today's discussion of the role of the non-discursive in ritual has led me to focus on the frame, and that, in turn, has revealed a new implication of the opacity of silence the way that silence has the potential to unframe and to move beyond the boundaries of convention. And with that, I'm finished. I thank you very much, and I, I look forward to, to your questions and your help as I continue to work on this paper. Um, thank you, Professor Weller. I think maybe we need a little while of silence to show our respect to process, <laughs> Professor Weller. <laughs> also for people to think about their question. Um, I guess we all have the experience that Professor Weller mentioned in his speech uh, from secular life activity uh, or from religious ritual. We all experience it, but we never think about um, how to analyze it from social scientific or even from anthropological theory. But Professor Weller displayed it beautifully. Um, last week, we, some of our colleagues have read um, Professor Weller's uh, two previous papers on silence. And we all agree that <laughs> those papers are beautifully written. So let's break our silence and we can ask questions to discuss with Professor Weller.
um, or I can break the silence. I, I have a question that we all know that in Buddhist meditation ritual, the monk or the nun, she or he will first start with a, a sound or a voice to show people uh, the session is begin. Uh, and the sound is very um, then all the meditation uh, will will begin and, and people will keep silence and, and in their meditation. Then maybe after 15 minutes or at the time of uh, then, then the monk or the nun will break the silence or the, the meditation with another yin qing. And I think it, it's also um, maybe can apply Professor Weller's theory that to start or to end, to frame the, the, the session. But I, I think Buddhist use of silence or quiet might be different from folk religion, but I, I haven't thought of that until today. <laughs> so th thank you. That's an interesting point. And I, I think in some ways it compares with the Quaker silence that I talked about, but with the crucial difference that you pointed out, which is that sound, that sound from the symbol or some sort of fa qi that says, now we start and now, and now we're finished, which the Quakers don't, the Quakers don't have anything like that. So they're continuing. The Buddhists are still happy to frame that moment. Within that, it's certainly meditational silence is that disciplined kind of silence. So like the Quakers, if, right, if you can't stand to be silent for Xiang, you don't go to the meditate, right? You know not to go to the meditation thing. They don't want you. And it's, it's like the Quakers in that sense. Um, but also if you can't do it, if you have to get up, if you wiggle around too much, someone's gonna criticize you, if not during the session, then after the session. So in that sense, like the Quakers. So those of us who spent time doing rituals with Buddhists know that there's always somebody turning turning around to amateurs like me and saying, you're doing it wrong. Your hands are in the wrong place. No, now your hands are in the wrong place again, right? That kind of disciplining is really common. So that, that's a very disciplined um, kind of silence and a virtuosic one, especially as you get good at it, right? As you develop your meditational skill from a few minutes to a few hours even. So that's that disciplined kind of silence. I think that's um, rare, but it is ritualized, especially in this Buddhist context you're talking about. Hey, Professor Ding Renjie, he raised his hand. Hello, Professor Weira, how are you? <laughs> yes. Hi, it's so, Hi. so good to hear your voice. I can't actually see you. Yes, yes. Uh, because we, we previous, previously, before we read, read your paper on silence, but it's quite different from today's topics. In pre, today, you mentioned three types of silence, silence for reason, moment of silence, and the silence of discipline. But uh, in your previous paper in the Suzhou Industrial Park, you mentioned about uh, the silence make, make a reason possible is one kind. The other kind of the silence of loss and longing. But today, they haven't talked much about those in industrial parks. In, in people in there, they're enforced to be silent. Like you, you, I remember you, you give an example of uh, Auntie Sue. She, she, she said, I can't tell you. So under I can't tell you, it's kind of enforced silence. People cannot talk, and the people feel kind of lose the past. Um, uh, in the past, they lose the past the time, and, and they're enforced to be silent. So it's kind of a silence inspired a reason of silence in the literature. So could you mention more about this, the other kind of the, the, the big silence for uh, people involved to be silenced under political control? And also you can mention more about your, your work in the Suzhou Industrial Park. In these several years, you have spent a lot of time in the Suzhou Industrial Parks, and you can come give some comparison between Suzhou and the Taiwan in your all the times in the Sanxia, it's kind of quite different political regimes and uh, 
the, the science listen the listen in the literature may be similar, but uh, the the back of the listen of the literature, the back of a friend, there are a lot of different feeling, emotional, emotional stuff about science. Can you mention more about this and give some comparison? Thank you. Oh, so that the, there's a lot there. So let me start with what I think is the easier part for me. The other kinds of silences that I wrote about in those other articles, which which have been published, so I, any of you can find them easily enough, I think. But I, I know some of you read them, I guess, last week. Yeah, there I talk about other kinds of silence that aren't the aren't moments of silence. They're not uh, rhythmic silence, um, and they're and they're not disciplined silence. The silence of loss and logging. The the silence of the silence of um, a dead parent, for instance, who's never going to speak to you again, that kind of silence. Um, but in the in, I think you're thinking more specifically of the kind of silence when you can't speak censored silence. Right, that kind of loss, the the. Uh, uh, you read the Feng John one, the, the one in how? Yes, so th yeah, that one. Um, that one where, you know, the step by step, the ability even to remember this dead daughter um, is taken away from people, right? Even to remember her ritually is, is taken away from people, that kind of silencing. But that's not ritual, right? That's, so that, those are all outside of a ritual context. So what those are doing is making ritual impossible. But it's not silence within a ritual context. It's that it's it's getting rid of the ritual completely, not allowing these rituals to take place at all. So I think that's a that's a really different kind of a thing that I wasn't in today's paper, I wasn't trying to address, but I don't think there's any inconsistency between talking about those silences of loss and longing and um, talking about these much more delimited silences that we do get within ritual frames. So really what I'm, unhappy with, frankly, in the Sujo one is the, is the uh, ever shrinking zone allowed for ritual, especially for popular religion kinds of ritual to go on. So it, it, it's, so those are non-ritual silences. Those are a um, much broader social phenomenon. Um, yeah, and, and not ritualized. So I do talk about rhythm I can't remember which was the other article that, that I sent you, but I do talk about silence and rhythm in non-ritual context, heartbeats, for instance. Um, but there's loss and longing. I think that's all of that is outside a ritual context. So how to compare Suzhou and, tai, and Taiwan? I mean, in some ways, it's a kind of good comparing. I mean, Suzhou's a city and Taiwan's a play, as you know, it's a great big place. But, you know, comparing Sunan, Right, so, southern Jiangsu with Taiwan, they're not that different in in size, really. Educational level, income level, you know, it makes a lot more sense than comparing Taiwan to China as a whole or something like that. And, you know, this, since I talked about the 1970s today in Taiwan, which was the, still very much the authoritarian period in Taiwan. Um, so this, the 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 weight of that state, the the Kuomintang state, it was heavy, and it weighed on religion too. But it wasn't trying to get rid of everything. So something like Iguandao, right? They had to be extremely careful. They were still illegal. Um, in uh, so I was there. I left in 1979, a few months after the United States had switched diplomatic relations to mainland China. And um, the rituals, so the big rituals for the God's birthday were in the first lunar month there. And so at that time, they had said, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to have any rituals. We're going to simplify, 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 and we're going to donate all the money we would have spent to buy, like, fighter jets for Taiwan's defense. You know, as if you could buy even a tire for a fighter jet from from all the money spent on that ritual, but still that, you know, there was that, that moment, but even that wasn't entirely 
pushed on people from above. I think it was partly that's really how they felt at the time. Well, what I'm talking about is, you know, much more of a state. So in Suzhou, I mean, in Suzhou, it's a state that's not exactly actively anti-religion the way it had been earlier. But it's encouraging a form of religiosity that doesn't leave much space for popular religion and that um, forced people into the hands of formal Buddhism or formal Taoism. And that combined with a formal Taoism that was really interested in becoming um, a rationalizing, standardizing, modern, in their view of modern religion, something that would appeal to a, a rising um, new wealthy bourgeoisie rather than to these ex-rural people who, whom I was studying in Suzhou. So that, you know, that was that combination of things that have really combined to, you know, to bury their deities physically, to stop their rituals, to get rid of spirit mediums, to do all of that kind of silencing, which again is taking place outside of ritual or against ritual even. So I don't know, Renjo, is that enough of an answer? I can see question from online audience. So, oh, uh, Shun De, Shu Li, Deng Yi Xia, Shu Li, Xia Yi Ge, Shu Li, Xia Yi Ge, Huh, Shun De, Xian. Okay, I'm Shun De. <clears throat> oh, thank you for uh, the great presentation. I really enjoy it. Um, uh, I have a question about zero now and the opposite that we always say Lang Qing. So when I'm studying um, the night markets, my informant always said, okay, I enjoy the real now in the night markets, but the opposite of real now is Lang Qing. And at the same time, so I think when we talk about a good funeral, I think a Lang Qing funeral is not a good one. Like we still, I mean, the Taiwanese still would like to have, not really cheerful, but you want to have enough Deng Qi, uh, enough people joined and to share the togetherness. And at the same time, you need to have some noises and nonsense certain moments. But so I, I just wonder whether when we study the noise and the silence, we need to uh, study them under the context of zero now in Nanjing instead of a kind of abstract the two factors out of the bigger cultural context. So thank you. That I think that's a really interesting way to put it. So if we think of zero now and Nanjing as a, a, like culturally appropriate, right? So if you say a ritual. You know, it's Matsu's birthday, but you know, it was a, it was so long chain, you know, it was like this was terrible. You want it to be it really needs to be a Rano. Now a funeral, and I'm, I'm not sure Rano, I'm not sure those words work exactly the same way, but that there needs to be so and even you switched words, right? You talked about Ran Chi instead of your Ran Chi instead of Rano. So you know, I'm not sure that we have a simple pair that covers the same thing, but I like the idea. I really like the idea of using a Chinese pair that's not the same as silence and noise. Right? So, Ra Nao and Lang Qing is not, it's really hot and cold as opposed to noise and silence, or at least Ra Nao gets you both hot and now could be noise. Um, but Lang Qi is picking up a different metaphor from that. So I, I, I like that. I think maybe there's some place to go with that. On the other hand, as you could see from the substance of the piece, I'm trying to do something that would, that would let me speak beyond just Taiwan or beyond just Chinese societies. But, you know, maybe the answer is take Ran Nao. You know, that, that doesn't mean you can't use Ran Nao and Lang Qing. You know, maybe the answer is you take 
run on Long Qing and use them as broader comparative uh, concept. So I'm not, I'm not sure. But this is a new, it's a new thought. Thank you. I'll have to think about it to see, you know, where, where I might be able to go with it. But I think it's a really intriguing thought. Shuli. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for the wonderful talk, and it's always inspiring. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh God. Okay. So, um, I actually I read your papers and I love it. Though. Okay. And my question will be a little bit like uh, Professor Ding Renjie's questions. So, uh, in the two papers you wrote and published previously, the context of urbanization is always important. Uh, but I'm kind of uh, wondering that today, uh, well, I'm kind of surprised that today you didn't mention anything about modernization or urbanization in your talk. So uh, I would like to ask you, how is this framing and unframing or silence and the noise the, uh, dynamic work in the context of urbanizations? And especially um, something in my mind is that, um, you know, in the in city, in a city, or controlling the noise is always an important thing. So, so how, 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 yeah, I would just like to see how you um, might respond to this kind of questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, Suli, open your camera. Okay. Let me see. I'm not. <laughs> Is okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So the other, the other two, the articles that you read, they're both somewhat experimental as writing, as I suppose this one is too. That is. They're combining some things most people wouldn't wouldn't combine. Um, but in those cases, it's the Sujo. The Sujo case is very much on my mind because that's been my recent field work. It, right? It hasn't been in Taiwan. It's been that Sujo thing. I'm probably I'm doing a book with my collaborator there, Wu Keping, on just on that material, and so I don't in this. This is toward a book, a different book on silence. And so I don't feel compelled to really develop that particular case throughout. And so um, I'm not bothered at all that this particular chapter didn't deal with Sujo and didn't deal with um, urbanization. Although, you know, one could certainly think about even funerals in, in, in a rural place, a semi rural place like Sanxia in 1978. And the role of urbanization and road construction, right? All of that stuff was going on, of course, at that time in Taiwan. Um, but uh, for you know, for this purpose, I'm not bothered by that. But the other, the other side of your question, like, so how does noise and science fit in to urbanization? And it, you know, it's interesting that you brought up like noise, noise pollution or noise control ordinances. Or things like that. So, as you might know, um, in Taiwan, at least, one of the major reasons people call the noise control offices of their local government is ritual, right? They're really bothered by the run is not what you want when you're trying to go to sleep, right? Um, and so, you know, there are a whole range of issues about how you deal with noise in urban environments that have been controversial, right? So for multiple reasons, people are trying to reform ritual in Taiwan and um, in the People's Republic of China as well, although it's a different dynamic. But there's environmental reasons why you want to not shoot firecrackers and burn incense, um, burn paper money, right? All of that stuff, which is important to a ritual. So I, I I'm feeling so out of touch with Taiwan, with like real life, 
because of COVID. Uh, you know, I haven't been back to Taiwan for a long time or back to China for a long time either. Um, but, you know, my understanding was five years ago, maybe there was this real environmental attempt to stop noise pollution and air pollution that went on through temples and temple rituals. And that that kind of has faded and um, the right the the argument in favor of that kind of reform has really declined. But so where do you end up? I, I don't know, right? Cities are cities are really complex in this sense. So you know how how do you find a medium that allows people to have their lives um, in, both in the in their need for quiet and in their need for noise because we kind of need both at, at different times of our life. So that I think that's an ongoing negotiation. I think cities make it vastly more complex because of the range of kinds of people you get, right? You get cities, you're gonna have people who would never go to a temple, right? They have zero interest in a temple or they're that kind of Christian that wouldn't wanna get near a temple. And then you have the people who really don't feel they can live a proper life without doing that. Temples that have no income without doing large rituals like this. There are all kinds of competing interests that can be different in a really small scale um, village. So yeah, cities make it all much more complex. I don't know that they, for today's paper, I don't know that they change the dynamics of sound and silence within a ritual context, but I think they change what how and when rituals can take place and what they can do. How loud can they be, right? What, what can they really do? Do you have to stay inside the temple grounds or can you parade all through the town? Right, just for instance, all, all of that has to be decided. But those are, these are standard issues of urbanization, right? Just the, the much greater complexity of an urban environment and the need to balance the the various things off of off of each other. So I think that's I can see maybe the book as a whole should think about it. But again for this one chapter I'm, I'm not sure that it needs that urbanization needs to be talked about. I don't know. You look like I haven't convinced you. Chen Yang, question from Chen Yang. Okay. okay. Um, hello, Professor Weller. Uh, my, my question is related to uh, um, So you, you mentioned that um, for the Quakers, um, human language cannot be a proper mediation to communicate with God. So I, I think behind this, you, you also mentioned that there, there is a very specific uh, language ideology, or, or I can say semiotic ideology, um, especially Protestant semiotic ideology. Uh, so, so I'm wondering that is for the Chinese popular religion, noise itself is a proper way to communicate with God. So that we, we can say that um, Chinese popular religion and Protestants, they have different semiotic ideology rather than we can put it in, in a singular rituals analysis. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. I, I completely accept that point. I, I think it, it, it's certainly true. It's certainly true that the semantic ideology is very different. As to an extent, so I really didn't address that in the paper, although I think I didn't use the term, but um, the difference between Pentecostals and Quakers is also one of semantic ideology, even though they all accept that noise is not the way to communicate with the, with the sacred. But the, what is the way to communicate with the sacred, they have quite a different idea of how to do it. So for them, that speaking in tongues is not noise, right? That's the presence of the Holy Ghost. It's right there, even though to me and I presume you, it's it's like noise. It's really chaotic noise, especially that 
Zhen Yesu Jiao Hui version of it is very much chaotic noise. But even greater, right, far greater is the difference between a Chinese or Taiwanese popular religion, semantic ideology, if we want to call it that, and any any Christian one. And just the beginning that, you know, in the beginning was the word, that little quote that I, I read from, from the New Testament. Um, that's... That's not, you know, our, what I mean, what do we have in in China? We have Dao, Ke Dao, Fei Chang, Dao. Right? It's immediately suspicious of the word, not accepting of the word. So it, it's a, it, I think from the very beginning, it's a really different understanding of what language is and what and how to understand these non-linguistic things as well. Yeah. So thank you. That's a good point. Thank you, Professor Weller. Uh, my name is Chu Wen Shei. Um, I love your talk. And uh, since you mentioned the pandemic, my question is about the pandemic. Uh, but I know you mentioned that you won't, you didn't, uh, you are not, you were not in Taiwan or China during that time. But because um, your talk remind me the last year when I was in Japan and I was in a funeral, I just noticed that because you know all the strategy and policy say that people, if you are in the rituals or funerals or anything related to religion, you should keep silence or you know the social distance, and you cannot really you know have a or anything. So I was wondering, this kind of disasters or any kind of external forces that enforce people to have to keep silence would this kind of um, influence the rituals and it might also be in weaven into the modern rituals like people now figure it out maybe keeping silence in a certain time um in the funeral or the rituals it's kind of it's it's not that and also how to say that and i also found that it's kind of like related to like um for example um in the funeral and people felt figured out that keeping, uh, sorry, let me clarify my question. So you mentioned that um, silence is rare and also the noise is not rare. And right now maybe it kind of ups, become opposite during this kind of uh, exceptional or uncertain time. So I was wondering um, in your research if you found this kind of situation or condition right now, thank you. Oh. I wish I had a good answer to that. Um, I don't know. So you're, especially for funerals, you're certainly right, because I think all over the world, uh, you know, at least for the first year or two of COVID, either there were no funerals for people or they were greatly reduced in what kinds of events they could be. So, you know, it, at least in my imagination, they're more silent, even you know, wearing these masks at events like that um, make it harder to make noise, make it harder even just to speak. And so, yeah, do they become more silent? And then the second part of your question, I think is not answerable at all yet, but, you know, might that have a long-term, might people decide, oh, that, that was actually a good way of doing it. We like it like that. We'll keep it. So I don't know. The closest I can think of ethnographically, and I'm drawing on work of an um, ex-student of mine, Liu Huimin, who's now at uh, George Mason University, who has a book coming out on the funeral industry in Shanghai, where she talks about the, like, it's in the 1950s into the 1960s, they kind of don't know what to do about funerals. They don't know, they don't like these folk religion-y things going on, but they don't, they haven't figured out what the proper communist kind of funeral is going to be until you get to the cultural revolution. And then basically you can't do any ritual. You can't do anything. And she talked to some of the older people working at the place she studied, at the funeral home, she the Guan she studied. And she said, what did they do? What did people do? And he just said, oh, they, you know, they would come and kan kan, kui ku, 
That was it. There was nothing. There was nothing. But that, so that's a kind of funeral reform, right? Down to an absolute bare minimum of the, the most Lung Qing possible funeral, I suppose. Um, but that didn't last. They got rid of that. So that, so I'm, so if, if I have to guess, and it's really all I can do, if I have to guess, it's that these colder funerals that we've had to have for the last couple of years will not last and we'll go back to something like the old one. But I don't know, it's a really intriguing question. Uh, Xie, Xie Zhu Wen is a postdoc in, in our institute. Now we have uh, Lin Jingzhi. Uh, thank you, Professor Weller. Um, I was in, very uh, inspired by your talk, uh, but I just wonder if there are any um, hierarchical differences between a state official ritual and popular religion um, temple festival or um, temple rituals. Uh, maybe. Silence and noise means difference in different uh, categories. Um, so just wonder, uh, do you have any comment about that? Thank you. It's an interesting question. I probably don't much know the answer. I, so the, the only thing, you know, China had a whole state cult. It would have been good to ask that question in the Qing dynasty or something. Um, you know, there were so many rituals and I don't really know I, I imagine I know what some of them looked like because of that Confucius birthday ritual, but I, I don't know. Uh, and, you know, we have, we have paintings of some Qing court rituals, things like that. We have some, oh, are we still connected? Yeah. We have some, we have some uh, um, evidence of things like that and they look cold and quiet and not run off, right? They look extremely, uh, controlled and orderly. But was it all like that? I have no idea um, if it was or not. But, you know, so what are state rituals now? State rituals are, are um, you know, Shuang Shi Jie or something like that, National Days, 4th of July in this country, right? We have those, so we have official state rituals like that. But we don't have a lot. For them, so what do those rituals consist of? Military parades, often, right in the in the U.S. or parades, parades of veterans, parades with fire trucks going by. Those things are they're not run out like Mazu's birthday is run out in Taiwan, but they're kind of on the run out end of things. They're not so I wouldn't say all state ritual is always on the cold side, on the Lung Qing side. Um, in China, mainland China now, we, you know, where you do get these, so I, I guess it's not fair to call them state rituals, but things like the Mazu Miao thing in Nanjing that I described, um, which was really put on by the local government, and that, which is why it looked so much like a communist party meeting. You know, that was much, that was an attempt to make a really cold thing, but it was sabotaged from below by all the people there, all, um, most of whom were businessmen from Fujian. I think it was an attempt to appeal to Taiwan businessmen, but they knew the ritual would be lousy by their standards and they didn't come. But all of these Fujian business people did show up, but they didn't, they didn't put up with it either. Um, so I think that, you know, that contrast was an attempt to get at one kind of state valuing of not silence, but low sonic density, uh, as opposed to popular value, uh, valuing of Jean Um But I'm not sure I would general, I'm not sure I would generalize or how much I would generalize even within a Chinese context from that. Um, we have a question from Lin Weiping. Weiping, you open open your camera. Okay. Um, 
thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Rob. Um, it's really uh, great to hear this talk, and um, thank you for raising the issue um, noise and silence. Um, I think we uh, in the con you know in the fields in the field work we we've been uh, you know bumping into silence and noise but never know how to deal with this. So thank you very much for raising this issue for us. So uh, next time when we go to the field, we can pay more attention, at least more attention to, to you know to to the the as as no ethnographical details and see whether they are something we can do in the future. So um, um, today when I when I was listening to your talk, that there was a lot of confusion for me. Sorry to say this, but it also means very inspiring. So now I'm just raising, you know, my confusion and then, you know, hope that you could uh, help us to clarify. Firstly, you know, you uh, you raise the issue of, um, you know, when you raise the issue of noise and silence, you you both say that it friends and it refrains, right? Um, so, um, but the point is, in your whole talk, I sometimes got lost, you know, for example, what noise friends and what noise refrains, uh, for example, uh, at the beginning, it said it seems that you say that the, uh, the noise and friends our emotion and affect, right? This is what we ex experience in the field. Seems that um, during you know when the you know when the trumpet comes or when the you know when the music comes, our emotion and you know affect sort of uh, unfriends, right? But then at the end, you also say that noise friends, right? You say, you say noise, it's difficult to disrupt, disrupt something. So it seems that it both friends something and, you know, um, how should I say, something is fixed there. So difficult to, to difficult to disrupt, right? So um, this is why I I'm not I'm really not very sure when you are talking about even you use the you know you even you use the the phrase you know framing and unframing frequently but seems that it seems that in different contexts what things it unfriends and what things it uh, friends are different so in the case of silence. Um, what I heard from your talk is silence on friends or thought, very rational thought, right? So, um, so at that period, especially Quaker, it seems that um, it's the period that you your thought is, is free or sort of, um, 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 you know, language cannot constrain, cannot constrain our thought anymore. So. Anyway, so I what I what I feel very interesting and not really resolved, you know, I, I feel still very confused even after your talk is that, you know, you raise the issue of noise and silence. It seems that you are using this. Uh, I don't know whether it's a dichotomy or, you know, opposite, you know, concept. You you try to, you know, you raise this issue and then sort of question us that we have to rethink new what ritual is, right? That, you know, we've been ignoring the, the you know, the, dif the, the differentiation of noise and silence, but, but, you know, it seems that you want to push us ahead and then, you know, talking about what noise friends and what noise um, friends or what silence on um, friends and it friends. So what I want to, uh, you know, maybe you can say a bit more whether my interpretation, you know, this kind of interpretation is correct or, you know, uh, something further details you want to talk about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, A Ping. Um, you know, the first thing you said was something we all experience in the field, but we don't often stop to think about it. And now maybe you can. So all I wanted to say to that was, you know, this these funerals I described. It was forty four years ago. It was nineteen seventy eight, and 
I had all this material I never knew what to do with. I never knew how to think about it. I was always puzzled by that silent moment, which got me to think about the noisy moments. We don't think about the noisy moments because they seem normal and natural and we take them for granted. But that, you know, it's this sort of, you know, right? This is why we take good notes in the field so that 44 years later, you can come back to them and, and think about them in hopefully a new way. All right, but that wasn't your real question. Your real question was about the framing and unframing stuff. So what I mean to say primarily is noise frames ritual context. And silence can unframe them. So yes, it can frame affect too, but I don't think it necessarily frames affect. That is, ritual can induce affect for sure, um, but it doesn't have to. I, don't, I wouldn't consider that part of the definition of what a ritual is. So what I, what I really wanna emphasize is noise frames ritual and silence has the potential to unframe that ritual. Uh, Wei Ping, if Professor Weller agreed to deliver the paper to you, maybe you can better understand his speech today. <laughs> so I I accept that there's a lot of stuff thrown in here, and it's I mean honestly I know it's too much to digest orally, you know just by hearing it it needs to be read. So of course Wei Ping, if you want it, it's yours. Um, uh, what I try to, you know, um, after your, how should I say, your, your explanation, I just feel that, you know, um, it seems that, um, noise and silence, um, um, ends the ritual, you know, section of the ritual in different ways. For example, uh, if you you know, in uh, the popular religion ritual, you always feel, you always hear that, you know, sort of uh, the sort of, you know, the uh, just run out at the end. So um, it seems that it leads to another section of the ritual. So in after a long process and ends up sort of very noisy, you know, so you see, Tao is the ritual too. At the end, it's always the peak. That uh, very noisy. It ends in silence, totally in silence, as you said in the in the talk. So what I what I was wondering is that what kind of different beginnings that it, it tries to. I mean, this ritual tries to. By using this noise or silence, what kind of new beginning that it leads to? This is what I'm, you know, because I think this is more or less why we are talking about, in a way, also one of the ways that we are thinking about noise or or silence, right? Because in rituals, we 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 encounter sort of different ends. Sometimes it ends with noise. Sometimes it ends in silence, and then. You know, we never thought about this before. We just took we just took it for granted. So this is why I think you know uh, what kind of different me you know sort of maybe different mechanisms or different um, effects of uh, you know silence of noise, and then the next stage you know leads to a different stage. This is what I've been thinking about. Um, so if we pay more attention to noise and silence, then we can understand this ritual more, you know, not just, uh, you know, stuck by uh, symbols or, you know, uh, sort of only the obvious structure of rituals. Uh, yeah, so I think that, I think that's a good point. I wouldn't mind a list of more things that end in silence because I really, couldn't think of any other ones in my China or Taiwan experience that end in silence beside this one. But I, your question is right. That, I mean, 
even one is enough to think about your question with. So what difference does it make that it ends in, in silence? And I see, I only see two ways to deal with the silent ending. So the noise ending is, is really just the ritual is over, right? The, the gavel banged again, the court case is finished for today, the judge is leaving. That, I don't know if Taiwan courts work that way, but American courts work that way, right? The sound marks the beginning and it's the sound marks the end, you return back to the rest of your life. Um, or you return to your new state, right? If it's a rite of passage, you, re, you, you not return, but you enter your new stage of life. Silence does something else, silence unframes, but unframing also means making other things possible, right? Un unframing is the potentially more radical of the two, I think. So ending in silence, I think there's two ways to think about that funeral ending in silence. One is it's not actually ending. It's just a rhythmic stage, right? What I said, if it's, you know, if we do chi chi, so this is just, you know, marking that, marking that rhythm. So we're not, the ritual's not over, it's continuing. So that would be one way to think about it. But the other way is to say, well, okay, three ways. I'm thinking out loud here. Second way is to say it's unframing. It's really unframing the way John Cage was trying to do to music. It's really unframing and leaving the possibilities of the, of the world open to people. And then the final, the final way to think about it, which I think is probably more relevant to the funeral one, is that it's really controlled. So at this point, at least in the funeral, there are only a handful of people left, only the immediate family is left there. So there's maybe 10 people instead of hundreds of people. It's much easier to control and they're, they're all exhausted. You can mark, you can frame with silence, if you can really control it. It's just that it's very difficult to do that, but this might be the sort of unusual circumstance where that would really work. Now, so which of these is more important or when is each of these more important? We would need more cases to think about it. And I don't have any more cases, not from Taiwan or from China. We have more question here. Uh, the first okay. one is from Li Meijin. She's a junior colleague of the Institute. Meijin. Uh, thank you, Professor Weller. Um, uh, sorry. Thank you, Professor Weller. So it's really nice to uh, have this talk. And I'm actually uh, very new to this uh, field of religion. So I'm just recall my experience of being in those rituals funeral rituals or rituals in the popular religion. And uh, I remind it of those like noises, like big music or how we as uh, individual participant uh, cannot communicate. So we need to remain silence within those noises, right? Because it's so loud to really have uh, verbal communication. So I feel like maybe there's something about like silence within noises. And, and also remind of the saying that sometimes silence is the loudest noise. So I was wondering like how you think about this silence and noise, not maybe not as the sequence of some kind of construct, but something maybe at uh, the two sides of the same coin or the framing effects of uh, noises and the unframing effects of silence might happen together. I'm just wondering if uh, this might have something um, some of the uh, experiences or your uh, uh, material can talk about this kind of thing. Thank you. First of all, uh, we will collect a uh, question then for you to answer. Second one is from Zheng Weining. She's also a colleague of the Institute. And then Zhu Fang Yi, the third girl. Okay. Uh, Oh, thank you, Professor Weller, for your wonderful talk. Um, I was very, um, I'm very inspired by, by your talk. And I pretty appreciate uh, that your analysis, um, your today's talk is about the, uh, the provide 
a non-representational analysis of silence and ritual, which is quite impressive. And I have got a question about the when you mention or oh, when you mention that you see the funeral as an emotional choreography, um, which is very very interesting. But I I'm wondering that. Um, but I have some question from the the the, the word the, the the term choreography. Since uh, for me, choreography is kind of a well organized act, and and it leaves little space for improvision. And so I'm wondering. I mean, for example, as as in the funeral, uh, in the fil uh, in the funeral, there's of course, there there are some uh, performance of grief expressed by the the sound of crying from the bereaved family, but I'm also I sometimes uh, v um, observe that uh, there are some fam some family members showed quite um quite intense emotions emotions beyond expectations. At the site, and during the during the, the ritual process, so I'm wondering what kind of road will you attribute to this uh, unexpectedly intense emotions from the family of from the bereaved families, and this also linked to my second question is that what kind of um, whether or not this kind of unexpected intense emotions and have any influence on the on the friend of ritual or 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 the structure of the ritual and which is i i'm kind of um concerned with uh, thank you very much yes yes uh, hi, Professor Weller. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I really learned a lot. And uh, during your talk, I start to wondering about question of dynamics, especially from different actors in rituals. Because during my fieldwork in Taiwan in 2019 and 2020, I kind of noticed that uh, if a uh, Divine parade, for example, a Rao Jing is held in a larger scale. For example, people are carrying their uh, deities or idols or or sitting chairs in a large scale of city. Um, it's impossible to ask them to sustain their uh, vibrant power to hold that real now status in a very long distance. So they have to like visit a temple and or a shrine and they go into a now status and then they will leave in a more quieter status. So I can see the rhyme here, but that's from the viewpoint of a, of, of a ritual attender, for example, people who visit the shrine. But during the Zen ceremony, if you Took it from the viewpoint of the the people who receive those uh, worship. They are always in a status that is real now. And also in the case of funeral, um, for example, we can see sometimes family members giving a quieter status. However, for those who have to host the whole ceremony, they have to keep talking and make sure the music won't stop. So I was wondering um, how to apply such a rhythm between silence and noise and also incorporate more viewpoint from different attenders, or maybe there is a kind of hierarchy. That's my question. Thank you. Hello, Professor Weather. Um, so my question is uh, quite similar to the previous uh, two Meijun and also uh, Fang Yi. And I will make the uh, question short. And your dichotomy um, 
of silence and noise is quite uh, convincing to me. Um, but I'm just wondering, and I want to look more into the details or what would you might say to the texture of the soundscapes. So, um, so the inner soundscape and the uh, inner ring and the outer rings, it might be different. So it might create a uh, dichotomy between the noise and the silence. So uh, especially in a ritual uh, in the field. Uh, so it's, I think the, the question is quite similar to, to the previous ones. So how, how can you recognize and trying to make a difference between these two and trying to uh, see the di uh, dynamic which can you know make the soundscape really reach the um, emotional efficacy that you you have raised so my my uh my example will be uh, in burma because in burma the loudest songs the louder music it creates actually people wanted to get that to get into trends themselves so that they can get the inner peace the inner piece of their 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 whole uh, whole uh, whole mode at that time. So it is quite contrast uh, from what you mentioned in in the Chinese or Taiwanese ritual. So that's uh, what I I want to ask about uh, how how you felt and how uh, so would you consider that the different textures of the soundscapes? Thank you. Um, we accept no questions. So please. <laughs> Please, Professor Weller, answer those questions. Okay, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad. There's no more than these four. So they, at least, there's some overlap in this last set of questions. So that that's um, that's helpful. Uh, I see there's a fair amount going on in the chat, which of course I have not been able to read, but. Um, at least I hope I get a chance to read it, um, John Osher, before, before before we end, and I don't have access to it anymore. So let me let me try to answer the the questions. So the ah the first one was, was noise and silence as two sides of a of a coin. So I actually had a an example in the paper, I cut it out for time reasons, but it is of a traditional bride in a sedan chair being carried from her natal family to her new husband's house. And that's that's run now, right? There's, there's all kinds of noise going on. Everybody's making noise except for her. She's silent, she's all by herself. Even if she wanted to speak, there's nobody, right? There's nobody to speak to, but she's not supposed to speak anyway. She's silenced. So that I think that's actually not unusual. Um, even the audience in the concert hall with which I started, the concert's not silent, but the people are the people are silent. So that you know, there's a very different experience if you're on the stage and if you're sitting in the in the audience. So I do think that that's. Um, that's always true and that would have, so the problem with revisiting your field materials 44 years later is you can't go back and ask the questions that you would have asked at the time. So I think these things looking for a finer texture out of that material, it's going to be very difficult for me actually to do, but it's a, it's a, a reasonable thing to ask and expect. And I think to some extent we can talk about it because there, there's certainly cases where it's two sides of a coin. I think we can think of quite a few examples that are like that. Um, is it Zhong Weimin, the choreography question? So the the question about the relationship between um, choreography and improvisation is actually a question about all, all ritual has this problem. That is, all ritual has to be a repetition or it doesn't count as having been the ritual, but on the other hand, you can't actually repeat, right? You never get it right. Um, so I, I think there's an interplay between 
improvisation and I, in ritual we call it liturgy, but chor choreography, since I, I did use that term, but between improvisation and choreography or improvisation and the musical score in any, in any ritual, there is some. So the question is, have you improvised so much that it no longer counts as the ritual? And that's never, I don't think there's an abstract answer to that, right? That's only answered in the actual context where people say, well, that ritual was a disaster that, you know, that didn't work. The God's not going to be appeased. Um, the God's going to be angry. That, that Ma Zhu Miao thing in Nanjing was a little bit like that. Um, or even, you know, you two aren't really married. That wedding didn't count. The ritual was so wrong so improvised that it can't count as the ritual, right? You got drunk, you went to a bar, you said your vows, you exchanged rings. What does that count or not count? So that, that's, and you know, those are discussions that have, that bring us to the questions of who has the authority to determine whether it counts or doesn't count. Um, so I think that's a, I think that's a, I think that's a, a kind of normal part of of what every ritual has to deal with to some extent. Um, can it change the ritual frame? Yeah, in principle, it can change the ritual frame because every time you have to make a decision, like did it count or not count? Well, if it counted, then now you know you have that room, you have that flexibility in the ritual or it didn't count, you know, you don't have that room in there. So I think the potential is there. That's something we could look at, um, you know, ritual by ritual and case by case. Um, so Fang Yi's question of, about, um, right, the host has to make sure everything is run out, but the guests can kind of sit back and relax a bit, or, you know, it's like teaching a class. If you're the teacher, even if it's a discussion-based class, you always have to be on, but the students at any given point, the student, any given student can kind of sit back and daydream a little bit and take a break. Right, have a, what we could call a quiet moment, but the teacher doesn't have, isn't supposed to have that luxury. So that's again, you know, asking for this texture, what Xin Chung called the texture of the um, of the sound, we could say. And yeah, so I, I do think that's a good point, and you certainly can do that. The texture is different, and the expectations of people are different. So I, I, I think that can all be that could all be done in a much more fine tuned kind of a way than than um, I actually did. And then and then I think Xin Chun's question was really getting at the same that same question of she called it texture. It's kind of an interesting term um, for it. But you know, get, getting at how the different people involved might understand a shared experience, but in different ways. I think that's certainly. Um, that that certainly is part of what's going on here, but it, you know it, it just requires a, a closely attended to ethnographic eye. I think the time is late in Boston, and we we all see that Professor Weller is tired, exhausted. <laughs> So I believe uh, Professor Will will receive any uh, email letter to discuss with him personally. So I, I would welcome any of you to be in touch at, in, at any time. Okay. So thank you, Professor Will, today. Thank you. Thank all of you. I really appreciate the feedback. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh, 谢谢各位了,